In the 1970s, high-tech workers in Los Angeles began building a new generation of spaceships. And the first to be launched was the spaceship called Columbia. It blasted off on April 12, 1981 and orbited the Earth 36 times. And since then, many more missions eventually followed into outer space. But the Columbia ship ended in tragedy on February 1, 2003. Basically, the ship tore apart while it was re-entering Earth. So the story behind this is that a piece of foam peeled off during the launch 16 days prior and damaged one of the wings. The great heat from re-entering the Earth caused gases to penetrate the ring, triggering this catastrophe that killed all seven astronauts on board. Several years later, a report emerged about the destruction of the Columbia ship. In the aftermath, the flight director named John Harpold said this, You know, there is nothing we can do about damage to the thermal protection system. If it has been damaged, it's probably better not to know. I think the crew would rather not know. Don't you think it would be better for them to have a happy, successful flight and die unexpectedly during entry than to stay on orbit knowing that there was nothing to be done until the air ran out? So the evidence concluded that the crew didn't know that the situation was hopeless before the spacecraft broke apart 200,000 feet above Texas. Even in the final moments, the crew worked very hard to regain control of the ship, but unsuccessful. So this raised a question by John, which seems very haunting that I think a lot of us can think about. He asked this, what would you do if you knew the crew was doomed? Would you tell them, causing mental anguish, but giving them time to say their goodbyes and make their peace with God? Or would you remain silent, making the final hours fun and let them hope for a reunion with their loved ones? See, this isn't just an issue with spaceships because we see this in all of life too, confronting people with truth, right? We're thinking, oh, it's so offensive to tell people the truth. Wouldn't you rather just let them be happy even if it harmed them or led them to their death? And you can say the same thing about the gospel because the gospel is God's truth. And we see it today where when people preach the truth of the gospel, sometimes they get persecuted pretty bad, sometimes even put to death. And this goes all the way back 2,000 years ago. We see this happening with many pastors and missionaries and Christians who just wanted to live out the Christian life, but yet Satan is working in the world to attack the church. And we see how this started even all the way back to the days of John the Baptist, who came onto the scene and preached God's word to the people. You see, John the Baptist, we knew where this man stood. He didn't sugarcoat anything. He always told people the hard truth, whereas all the other false religious prophets and teachers told the people what they wanted to hear, even if it led to their spiritual death. John the Baptist told it the way it is. And that is why he has a message that all of us must listen to. Now, what, whether we accept it or reject it is going to pretty much be between us and God. But God is telling us, you be wise to really listen to what he says, because this is the truth. And that is exactly what we're going to be looking at today in John chapter 3, verses 7 to 20, in the message that I titled, The Hard Truth. So once again, the Gospel of Luke is a biography about Jesus. It talks about his life from the time that he was born to the day that he grew up, you know, as a teenager, all the way to when he was an adult and he started to preach and teach for three years and then he was pretty much nailed to the cross but that of course was God's plan to take our sins away and then he rose on the third day and this is the message that is pretty much going out into the entire world so that we can be saved. So last week we saw how John the Baptist started his ministry he came onto the scene and he told us how we should prepare for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. John was not the Messiah, but he said he's coming and I'm announcing that he's coming. So you guys need to be prepared. So this week, Luke is going to continue to tell us about John the Baptist's ministry, 
telling us how we are to prepare for the arrival of Jesus, which is we need to repent and have true faith. It's that simple, guys. That's the main idea of today's message. So this passage shows us two important things about John the Baptist's ministry in order to prepare us on how we are to respond to Jesus. So first, let's look at the first point together. We know how we are to respond to Jesus by looking at the message of John. In verses 7 to 14, John has a specific message that goes against what a lot of people believe about religion and about life. So let's look at it together. Verse 7. It says, So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, He said, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Wow, that starts off pretty strong. See, many of the Jewish people, they came to John the Baptist. They wanted to be baptized because they thought this will be earning me extra points to get to heaven. They thought that they were saved because they were following the Ten Commandments. They were following the rules of Judaism. They were born from a Jewish family. You know, all that stuff. But then John drops a bombshell. He calls them brood of vipers. He didn't call them, oh, you holy saints. He called them pretty much a den of snakes. Do you know why? Because these religious people, they always looked holy on the outside. They looked so shiny and polished. They're saying, oh, we're such great people. We're going to go to heaven. But John was saying to them, you guys are hypocrites. Inwardly, you guys are evil people. So he, let me tell you, John was not just saying this to any ordinary Jewish people. I mean, these people were actually pretty messed up. I mean, there were some people who were really seeking for God and truth. And of course, John was gracious to them. But these guys, wow, they were really deceived. And John was telling them, you're going to pretty much get God's wrath unless you repent. You see, in verse 8, he says this, Bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourself, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Here, God is telling us what repentance is. It says repentance has to bear fruit. A lot of people don't know what repentance is. That's why I tried to teach it to you guys again and again. Repentance isn't just saying, I'm sorry, going to somebody and confessing your sins. You should be sorry. But repentance is when you change your mind about sin, when you change your mind about how you're living your life or what you believe about God, you're basically turning away from your sin and you're turning to God. You see, when you're saved, you know what God does? He sends his Holy Spirit to you. And then the Holy Spirit pretty much makes you into a new person. You're born again. And when that happens, it's almost like you once had a dead tree and now your tree is bearing fruit. That's why he uses this analogy. I mean, could you imagine if you had an orange tree in your backyard? It calls itself an orange tree, but nothing ever comes out of it. Or even, or maybe like it's an orange tree, but, but like poisonous grapes come out of it or something like that. That wouldn't be good. You see, when God saved us, he basically called us to be a tree that bears fruit because all of us are called to bear fruit to be useful. Even in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Yeah, see, a lot of these Jewish people... They claim to be religious, but then they were not really doing God's work. They were doing evil stuff. They were greedy. They were proud. You know, all that stuff that pretty much marks dirty sinners. So he was telling them, examine your faith to see if it's real. Because if you have real faith, you should see a transformation happening in you. I heard a story about a Dutchman who was once converted to Christ after hearing the gospel. The next day, he went to the beautiful home of another Dutchman and said to him, Do you recognize this old watch? And that man said, Why, yes, those are my initials on the watch. I lost that eight years ago. How did you get it and how long have you had it? 
And that guy said, I stole it. And then the Dutchman at the house said, then what made you bring it back right now? So the first guy said, I was converted last night and I have brought it back the first thing this morning. If you had been up, I would have brought it last night. So basically the point of what I'm trying to say is that when you come to repentance, the shift in your attitude and will should be so drastic that even at times if you need to make amends with people that you have wronged, that's really what repentance looks like. You know, I've actually seen people who've, uh, I mean, I've even heard stories where they've done criminal activities. For example, like they robbed banks, they got away with it, but then they heard the gospel, they repented, they got saved. And you know what they did? They turned themselves into the cops. I mean, they didn't have to do that. They probably could have gotten away with it and nobody would have ever known, just live like an everyday guy. But yet he was trying to demonstrate, this is what I really, this is what really happened to me. I'm a Christian now and I have to live like it. And this is exactly what John is saying, what repentance should somewhat look like, or for the most part look like in our life. But these people, like I said, they were trusting in the wrong thing. You see right, what it says right here? It says that they were trusting in their lineage, which means we're Abraham's descendants because we came from Father Abraham. We're saved. We got a fast pass to heaven. No. You're saying you're not saved because you are a descendant of Abraham. He says salvation is individual, which means you can't get a fast pass to heaven just because you're a child of Abraham. And just like you at the church, you can't get a fast pass into heaven just because your parents are Christians or because they were elders in a church or deacons in a church. Uh-uh, God doesn't work like that. He says everybody needs to make an individual choice to be saved. Your parents cannot help you on the day of judgment. So every one of us have to do what is right. You see, this is what will happen if we don't take this seriously. You see what it says in verse 9? He says, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You know, trees in ancient times, they served a purpose. Their purpose was to bear fruit so that it can be food, so it can be used as merchandise too. It is useless to farmers to have trees that don't bear fruit. They're not just going to have a tree just sitting around doing nothing. So what they do is they cut it down and they make it into firewood. I know that this sounds like a very graphic analogy that John is using, but this is exactly how he depicts hypocrites and false converts is that if their faith is not real then on the last day of judgment they will be exposed and they will be pretty much chucked like firewood into hell forever yikes i mean this is how seriously god takes sin he's a holy god and he doesn't mess around with sin so that's why we should be so thankful that we have salvation if we are here today so basically, he's telling us you can know whether you're a real believer or not because you're, you're, it, you bear fruit. It's not you make yourself bear fruit by you know, trying to do a list of things to do. It comes naturally. You just say, hey, I want to do it. I have a will to do it. I want to serve in church. I want to tell people about Jesus. I want to live holy. You know, I want to give of my money to missionaries. You know, all these things that true Christians really do, like even the songs, I want to sing songs on Sunday. It's just so, it makes me so happy to sing, sing these songs. That's how you know that that's like real fruit that's coming out. It's evidence of your faith. But if all of that is like, no, I don't want to do that. No, no, no. It's like, oh, so disgusting. Oh, I hate doing this. I hate doing this. I don't care what you say. Your faith, you, you got to examine it. Because if you are very resistant towards the things of God, maybe because your parents is making you do it, then you're exactly in this category that John the Baptist is talking about right now. But it's too, not too late to get right. You see, he continues on with this in verse uh, 11 and 12, because these people, when they heard it, they were shocked. And a lot of them were convicted. They wanted to know, what can we do? That's what it says in verse uh, 10. He says, he says, the crowds were questioning him. Then what should we do? And then John says to them, The man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and he who has food is to do likewise. So basically he's saying, put your faith into practice. Be generous. 
share because you guys are just stingy and greedy. I mean, some of these people were, so that's why he was using this specific example. So of course, Christians should always be marked by generosity whenever possible. But then in verse 12, there was another group that came up called the tax collectors. And they came up to be baptized and they said, teacher, what should we do? You see, this is an interesting group that you're going to hear mentioned again in the future. Tax collectors at that time are some of the most despised people amongst the Jews. They worked for the Roman government. They collected taxes from the people so that they can ship it off to Rome. But do you know what these tax collectors did? They charged a really high commission, basically extorting your everyday people. And they kept that commission so that they could become very rich. And a lot of these tax collectors were actually Jewish people. So that's why Jews saw them as sellouts, basically. You betrayed us. So even these tax collectors, they said, oh, what should we do then? And you know what John says? He says it right here. Collect no more than what you have been ordered to. So basically he's telling them, don't rip people off anymore. Only charge them what you need to charge them. And trust that God is going to provide for the rest. Don't be stealing from people. So hopefully you guys won't do that if you ever become tax collectors in the future or something. But then there was another group that came, soldiers. They were also wanting to get serious about this. They said, what about us? What should we do? And John said to them, do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely or be content with your wages. You see, these soldiers, they were Gentiles. Wow, that's great. These Gentiles are actually seeking after God. They're saying, we want to be saved too. How do we know if our faith is real? Well, you know, a lot of these soldiers, some of them are very corrupt. They would take advantage of Roman citizens. They would rob them. They would lie to them. They would steal from them. They would intimidate them and bully them. So John was saying, don't steal money from them. Be content with what you're getting paid. And the same should be with us as well. So the whole lesson behind point number one is this. God plays no favoritism, whether you're Jew or Gentile. So the point is, if you claim to be a believer, you claim to be a Christian, examine yourself and see, is this tree actually bearing fruit? Is, it, is this tree alive or is this tree dead? Because if this tree is dead, yes, you have every reason to be concerned and you need to come to God in prayer, ASAP. But if it is alive, tell God, hey, don't let Satan stop this momentum. Keep it coming so that I can basically glorify you with my life. But then this passage also shows us another way we are to respond to Jesus or another pretty much a good reason to respond to Jesus. So the second point is this, the inferiority of John. The inferiority of John, meaning John was nobody special. He wasn't the Messiah, and he always directed glory to God. See, we see that in verses 15 to 20. Let's look at that. It says, Now while the people were in a state of expectation, and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ, John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water. But one is coming who is mightier than I, and I, am not to I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You know, John was so powerful that some people thought that John the Baptist was actually Jesus. They're saying, are you the Messiah? Are you the one we are following? You see the thing, you can notice who false teachers and false prophets are because when they get a cult following, they always like to project themselves as like a prophet or a messiah in some ways. That's how you know who false prophets are. But John, even though he could have gained this really huge cult following himself, he said, no, 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 not me. Glory doesn't go to me, but there's another one coming who's even mightier than me. And that's the one who you should be following. <laughs> that, my friends, is humility right there. He doesn't want fame or anything like that. He says that this one who is coming, he's so great that I'm not worthy to even untie his sandals. You know that job of untying sandals at that time? That was a job for slaves. And John was saying, I was not even worthy to do that with this person who was coming. Just like I said in John chapter 3, verses 28 to 30, like I read earlier, 
John said, you yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of Christ. He must increase, but I must decrease. So it's kind of like this. I don't know if, if you guys are familiar with Bruce Lee, the martial artist, but he's very popular. Even in the 60s, he was very popular too. A lot of people considered him to be possibly the greatest Chinese martial artist who has ever lived. And we know because we've seen his movies, we've seen his demonstrations. It's quick. It's very unusually talented. And you trained under Bruce Lee, let's say, as a student, which would have been a tremendous honor now that you think about it. But then what if Bruce Lee were to say, like another man comes in, another, it could be, I don't know, a Chinese man or Italian guy. So Bruce Lee says, this man right here is even greater than me. I am not even worthy to come into his presence. This martial artist, oh, he bows down to this martial artist right here. But then you're thinking, who's this guy? Okay, if that were to happen, would you kind of be in a sense of awe thinking, wow, this guy must be pretty dangerous if even Bruce Lee's bowing down to this guy? This guy is probably worth following too, or maybe even more. So in the same way, basically John the Baptist was trying to tell us he, he doesn't want any of the glory. He doesn't want to be worshipped. He doesn't want to be an idol. He says there's another person who's coming who's very extraordinary. He's like unlike any human being who has ever lived. That's the one who you should be worshipping. So not me. Because he says, I baptize you with just water. But this other one, Jesus, he's going to do something even more serious, I would say. He says he's either going to baptize with water or, or fire. You see what he says here? Baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So he's pretty much saying there's going to be one of two camps. Camp number one are Christians. Those are the ones who are baptized with the Holy Spirit, meaning when they believe in Christ, they have the Holy Spirit, they're cleansed of their sin, they're a new creation. But then he's also going to baptize another group with fire, speaking about unbelievers who will be reserved for judgment in the fires. So it's either one or the other. In verse 17, it talks about how he's going to judge. You see this example, this, uh, this analogy? His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. You see, at that time, farmers, they have what's called like a winnowing fork in which they would take all of this wheat and it has shaft inside of it. So how they would separate the two is that they would throw it into the air and the wind would blow the, sh the shaft, the shaft, <laughs> I don't know how to say it, but then the heavier stuff, the wheat would all fall into the ground. I think a lot of you guys know exactly where he's getting at with this one. He's basically saying on the final day of judgment, everybody in the church, you know, the claim to be worshipers of God, they'll all be mixed together. Sometimes it's kind of hard to tell them apart, but then he's the one who's going to sift it to reveal who is real and who is not real. So that's why this is a very important message of judgment because he's basically telling us there will be many false converts in the church who will be exposed on judgment day. Very serious. You see, even I, just like John the Baptist in many, in many ways, I'm preaching a hard truth to you. Do you know this stuff? They don't preach in a lot of churches out there, even in LA, that, that call themselves Christian. Now, I'm not saying that they're heretical churches, but they just don't like to go this in-depth by telling messages like this to people, by challenging their faith to see whether it's real or not. But I'm doing it because I care about you, and I want you to make sure that you're going to get into heaven and not fall through the cracks. You see, John, he preached a message, and eventually he got in trouble. Look at the last few verses. Well, look what happened with him. It says, So with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. But when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. See, John, he just kept going, preaching the gospel not taking a day off. 
preaching the gospel of how the Messiah was going to come. He was going to die on the cross for our sins. He was going to resurrect. And then we have to believe in Christ to be saved. You know, the only thing that saves, basically. But then there was this one very interesting incident. It doesn't talk about it in Luke, but it does talk about it in the other gospels. Where uh, John the Baptist, he confronted Herod Antipas because Herod stole his brother's wife. So she divorced his brother to come with him. And you know the crazy thing about the situation was that she was also his niece. Yeah, this is like pretty hardcore incest and adultery going on here. So he was saying, what you're doing is wrong, what is unlawful. And you know what usually happens when people are confronted over sexual sin? They freak out and they go after preachers of righteousness. And we see it just, just like that happening right here. So he was basically sent to prison, but then eventually, like Matthew says, his uh, quote-unquote wife, Herodias, hated what John the Baptist said. So she said, I want this man's head on a platter at my dinner party. So Herod did it. So John the Baptist eventually got beheaded, and they brought his head on a platter. Very, very gruesome. But the whole lesson behind point number two, which is the last one, is that when you preach the message of truth, you're going to get persecuted. So don't think that it's so strange. Don't think, I must be saying something wrong. So I think I'm just going to, you know, quit what I believe and just believe what they believe. No, he stuck to the truth, which is why he was persecuted. You see, he wasn't silent. He wasn't a man pleaser. But it says here that he was always faithful, even if it led to his death. So in wrapping this up, guys, the message of John and the inferiority of John the Baptist shows us that he is the forerunner of Jesus the Messiah. And it also shows us how to prepare for God's coming. So I want to ask you this as we close. Are you prepared for the coming of Jesus? We've been talking about it at the retreat for the last two days, but I want to really hit it home again because today we see John talking about it. Are you prepared for the coming of Jesus? Yes, he came one time in the past for one group, but then he's also coming again in the future for another group. So really, the best way to prepare is by examining your faith and asking yourself, is this a real faith? Is this a faith where I see my tree bearing fruit? Or is this a faith where I see a dead tree within my soul? And if you see that dead tree in your soul and you are frightened about it today, then I really want to encourage you to pray and to seek God's help so that you can see God not just save you, but also working in your life to make you into a new creation. But then even if you are a Christian, you know for a fact you're a Christian, you like to go out and tell people about Jesus from time to time, great. But I also want to tell you, keep doing it. Because John the Baptist, he did it and he was always persecuted, so you're going to be in the same camp. It's not a popular message. If John the Baptist suffered just like this, then you guys should expect some opposition too when you tell other people about the gospel. So I'm telling you this so that you won't get off guard. You won't say, oh, I don't want to do evangelism because people are going to hate me. It's okay because it happened to even John the Baptist. So go do it because God is saying it's all good. Even though the world may hate you, I love you. And I'm going to make sure you get your rewards when it's all said and done. Father God, we pray to give you thanks for this really beautiful but very hard reminder of what it means to be a Christian. You tell us that when we come to faith, we have to make sure we're trusting in the right thing. 
we need to examine ourselves to see if our faith is alive and if it's real or whether it's a dead faith. So we pray now, Lord, that you will grant faith here to somebody who needs it. If there's anybody here who really needs true faith, a living faith, then please give it to them today so that they can have assurance of salvation. We pray, Lord, that you can use us so that we can bring this gospel to other people who need it. That just like John the Baptist, that we won't be afraid, but rather we will have the courage to do what is right, to tell people about how they can have eternal life in Christ. And that if we do get persecuted, that in those moments we will cling to you, we'll pray to you, we'll trust in you. And even if the worst thing shall happen, we will not despair because we know where we will go for all eternity. So give us that courage. Give us that love of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.